Thank you. Welcome to the second session of the Cyber Security Revolution Conference uh, on criminological perspectives on ransomware groups and their activities. Thank you. Welcome to the second session of the Cyber Security Revolution Conference uh, on criminal. We are coming to you live from Australia and Canada. Uh, I am Chad Whelan, Professor of Criminology at Deakin uh, University. To my right here is uh, Dr. James Martin, a Senior Lecturer in Criminology at Deakin University. And to my left is uh, David Bright, Professor of Criminology at Deakin University. On the screen, I have Callum Jones, who's a PhD candidate at Monash University and a researcher with us on this project and of course Benoit de Pont from mm -hmm. University of Montreal who uh, needs no introduction here I'm sure. We're going to uh, have two presentations uh, for you today and we hope to engage in some um, pretty fluid conversation and discussion around and during each of these talks. The first one I'm going to hand over to um, James to uh, go through making sense of ransomware groups and their relationships with the state. Thank you, Chad. Uh, okay, so uh, the background to this paper really uh, has occurred in the context of um, rapidly going ransomware uh, attacks all around the world, uh, and also in this uh, heightened environment um, and consciousness that states themselves may be involved or are involved in a range of different offensive operations in cyberspace. Um, and there's really um, a bit of a, a false dichotomy in much of the research around this area that uh, looks at um, uh, these kind of offensive operations either as falling into a purely private cyber criminal uh, sphere where we're looking at the, you know, the, the actions of individual criminal actors uh, and those that fall into threats um, to cyber security. And this is something that Benoit and Chad have done uh, quite a bit of research on. Um, so looking at these as kind of military threats um, uh, and uh, you know, threats to national security. And what, we're, what we were keen to explore with this paper was that there's um, a gray zone in the middle here where um, we can have what appears to be ostensibly private criminal actors who uh, may be engaged not just in private criminal activity, but uh, uh, essentially doing the bidding um, of states, but in a way that is uh, concealed and obfuscated, um, such that the, the relationship becomes deliberately ambiguous. Um, so, um, so in terms of trying to conceptualize this, we're really trying to work in this angle of state crime. Um, and state crime is something that uh, we argue is a framework that has, has been underutilized when it comes to looking at these kinds of um, cyber operations. Uh, so state crime <clears throat> um, was a, a criminological concept uh, introduced by William Shambliss uh, in the late 1980s. Um, and uh, we've got this nice definition here, acts defined by law as criminal and committed by state officials in the pursuit of their job as representatives of the state. So this is quite a narrow definition, um, and it's since been broadened um, uh, to include um, uh, acts by state proxy forces. Um, and it's really had this historical sort of focus on, on violence, on state-linked violence. Um, so whether that's uh, the activities of, say, apartheid-era police in South Africa or the genocide of First Nations peoples in, uh, in Australia or you know, anywhere else in the world where that's happened, the Holocaust, so on. They're, they're kind of classic examples when people say state crime that tend to come to mind. Um, but there's another interesting example, and it was actually one that Shambliss used in his uh, 1989 presidential uh, address to the American Society of Criminology when he introduced this concept of state crime, and that is um, the notion of privateers. So historical privateers were um, uh, essentially, uh, they were private vessels um, that operated in the, in the golden age of piracy. And what happened was, um, uh, you know, the, the basic sort of environment in which this was introduced was um, you had Spain that had recently colonized the new world and was shipping huge amounts of gold and silver back to, uh, back to, the, back to Europe. And um, they had tremendous dominance in you know, conventional military terms, uh, naval power, uh, and were making huge amounts of money from this exfiltration of wealth from the new world. 
And um, of course, this attracted um, the attention not only of, of uh, criminal groups, so pirates, but also the attentions of rival states as well, um, which lacked the conventional naval power in you know, traditional naval vessels, frigates, men of war, that sort of stuff, to actually launch any kind of um, uh, you know, symmetrical kind of naval conflict with Spain. So what they did is they essentially teamed up with pirates um, and they started to co-opt private pirate vessels to act as their agents on the high seas. And they were issued with what was called uh, a letter of mark, which was um, an official contract between a state that transformed the pirate vessel into a privateer, one that had a pretty murky legal uh, right to prey upon any of the issuing states strategic rivals. Um, so, for example, the English or French Crown would, um, you know, issue a, a privateering license, a letter of mark, and that vessel would have the authority to prey upon Spanish vessels or English vessels or French vessels or whomever. Um, so the, the significance of this uh, will become clear when we're talking about the, the operation of contemporary ransomware groups um, in a minute. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so when we're looking at State cybercrime, this is something that, um, uh, as I mentioned, has sort of been under theorized, but it's tend to focus in particular kinds of areas. Um, so things like illegal mass surveillance. Um, so, you know, the, the prison operation and the, the Edward Snowden revelations are really, uh, you know, an archetypal example here. Uh, we've had a lot of focus on military and industrial cyber espionage. Uh, the big focus here has been particularly Chinese um, uh, theft of intellectual property. Um, that's something I think we might be talking about a bit after the presentation as well. Attacks on critical infrastructure. Um, so we had, you know, Stuxnet was a big one here, the targeting of um, Iranian nuclear facilities, which well, we don't have official confirmation, is thought to be undertaken by United States uh, and Israeli um, uh, security services. And then, of course, we've got information operations um, or disinformation operations uh, and um, uh, Russian influence of the uh, 2016 US elections conducted by the Internet Region, uh, Research Agency is, uh, you know, another archetypal example here. Um, next clip, please. Um, so all of these activities um, fall under practices that are historically associated with, with the behaviour of states. So we've got surveillance, we've got espionage. Um, secret attacks on rivals, um, propaganda and misinformation. All of this stuff is, you know, it's stuff that states have been doing since since their inception, basically. Um, and uh, when we see online evolutions um, of these same strategies, but, you know, using online tactics, this is consistent with, um, with Grabowski's idea that cybercrime is basically old wine and new bottles. You know, we're seeing the same practices just using different, different tools and techniques. Uh, next slide, please. So Grabowski himself um, uh, wrote about um, state cybercrime and proposed a continuum um, there being, uh, so he acknowledged the roles that, that proxy actors could have a relationship to the state. Um, and he proposed this continuum, uh, and I'm gonna quote here, a uh, quote from state ignorance, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of private criminal activity at one extreme to state monopoly of criminal activity at the other. In between these polar extremes, one might find state incapacity to control private illegality, the state turning a blind eye to the activity in question, tacit encouragement of non-state crime, active sponsorship by the state, loose cooperation between state authorities and private criminal actors, then formal collaboration between the state and non-state entities. So note here in this continuum that the state turning a blind eye to activity is considered at the lower end of state involvement in facilitating cybercrime. Uh, so that's that's a nuance that, that, we're, that we're gonna pick apart and is important for our analysis. Uh, so the utility of a continuum like this um, really lies in informing responses from the state. Uh, so if we have, for example, um, uh, on the left here, we've got a private criminal in, uh, actor engaged in a cybercrime activity of whatever kind you can think of, whether that's ransomware, uh, or whatever, the state is going to respond in a particular way um, and it's going to use its criminal justice agencies to pursue the private criminal actor. If the private criminal actor is located outside of that state, uh, obviously that involves some kind of transnational policing cooperation, 
uh, either providing intelligence um, uh, to, you know, to uh, cooperating states, law enforcement agencies to identify the people involved, um, that sort of thing. Um, if, however, we've got a private criminal actor that is actively sponsored by the state, or we've actually got a state actor that is involved in cybercrime, then a law enforcement response is not appropriate because you're not going to get that cooperation that you need to that, that you would in it if there was a private criminal actor uh, involved. Um, so if if that's the case, what you what you're going to need to have is some sort of political you know solution to this this uh, this problem, a political or perhaps a military one as well. And we saw an example of this um, back in 2015 where there was a, a short-lived, uh, as it turned out, a cyber treaty negotiated between US President Obama and um, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping about the theft of intellectual property. So, you know, these were state-linked organizations or state actors, um, explicitly state actors. And when this treaty was signed, the amount of um, uh, intellectual property thefts in, conducted by these cyber um, criminals dropped dramatically, albeit for a limited period. Uh, so we've got this, you know, relatively clear continuum here from the private criminal actor all the way up to state actors um, and a bit of grey in between. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> uh, we argue here that this, this dependence on a relatively clear identification of where an actor sits on this continuum uh, is one of the necessary uh, preconditions for a proactive response to cybercrime. Um, so by proactive responses, you know, we're talking about things like law enforcement operations um, or perhaps, uh, you know, offensive cyber operations that are targeting uh, the group or some kind of, you know, political or military engagement um, that might take place outside of the cyber realm. Uh, what we're not including here is cybersecurity, which is a defensive response. And, you know, that's, that can work. Um, regardless of, of the nature of the, the threat actor we're talking about, whether they're private criminal um, or, or whether they're a state actor. Uh, but there's a grey zone here. Um, and the questions that we that really prompted us writing this paper is what happens when the relationship between a state and a criminal actor is, is tenuous, it's ambiguous, or it's explicitly denied. Um, so we don't have a clear idea of where it sits on this state continuum, a uh, state crime continuum. Uh, what happens when the relationship between a criminal actor and a state changes over time? So it's perfectly feasible, for example, that we have a private criminal actor uh, engaging um, in a private uh, uh, cyber crime, but then doing some work for the state and then, you know, engaging back in private um, cyber crime. So you could have groups that are moving along this, this continuum. Uh, or engage simultaneously in different types of um, offensive cyber operations, one of which might constitute a private cyber crime, one might be um, one that's happening at the behest of a state. Also, <clears throat> uh, we would argue that um, when we look at this delineation between private uh, cyber crime activity and uh, state cyber crime, that there tends to be um, uh, a readiness to appreciate state involvement when it's involved in those particular kinds of um, uh, cyber activities that we talked about. So surveillance, espionage, um, information operations. But what happens when we start to have state involvement in cyber crimes that fall outside uh, those traditional kind of prerogatives of statecraft? Um, and, you know, we, we use the example of ransomware and, and, uh, and financial crime more generally. So this is basically what we're arguing represents the current situation when it comes to Russian ransomware actors. Um, the, the relationship with the, with the state is one that is denied by explicitly by the Russians. Uh, we've even had President Vladimir Putin, you know, explicitly say that there's you know there's no relationship between the Russian state and the Russian state wouldn't stoop you know to to be involved in these kind of operations. Uh, but should we take him to his word? Well, you know, we would argue that you should not. Um, and for the following reasons. Next slide, please, Dave. Uh, so <clears throat> to try and figure out a little bit what's happening here and reconceptualize, uh, we've drawn on some of the literature from uh, grey zone warfare. So going into to IR studies um, uh, and military strategic studies. And grey zone warfare, uh, we've got this nice definition from Price here, coercive activities which do not reach the threshold of conventional military warfare, 
enabling the perpetrator to avoid risks associated with escalation. Um, so these are offensive operations undertaken by a state or by its proxies, uh, but trying to, to do uh, to inflict damage, to, to shift the strategic balance of power in favour of an antagonist, but without risking out uh, an out military conflict. Um, and uh, Russia has a long you know, history of the use of grey zone warfare tactics to compensate for its weaknesses um, against the West and against the US in particular. Uh, and it does this in a couple of ways. Um, so escalation can be avoided through the use of non-state proxies, uh, which allow an antagonist state to say, well, it's not us doing this stuff. You know, with these people, they're not in Russian uniforms. Uh, we have no idea or control over what they're doing. Um, and we saw examples of this with Russia's 2014 annexation of Crimea, which was ostensibly you know, conducted by Russian troops. But the Russians said, no, these are, these are homegrown separatists. Uh, and the boundaries were sufficiently murky uh, for enough time that it delayed a response. It certainly delayed a quick um, and effective proactive response from the West there. What we also see uh, accompanying the use of non-state proxies uh, which enable this plausible deniability is the use of what they call salami slice slicing tactics. And salami slicing tactics um, are basically, um, instead of inflicting large amounts of damage in a single kind of attack, uh, which would cross an escalatory threshold, what you want to do is inflict small amounts of damage incrementally over time. So you slice that salami in such a way that no single attack uh, crosses an escalatory threshold, but when we consider the damage that they inflict in a cumulative sense, then we can see that perhaps that would have if that was inflicted all in one go. Uh, so we've got this, uh, these two things being used in combination. Um, uh, salami slicing attacks falling underneath an escalatory threshold carried out by non-state proxies, which enable um, plausible, you know, plausible deniability. So the real advantage for this uh, in Russia, which, you know, despite its massive nuclear arsenal, um, it does not have sufficient you know, economic, uh, conventional military power to take on the West directly. This is a way that a state like Russia can leverage um, uh, the other resources at its uh, disposal to try um, and erode the power of, uh, of rival states. Uh, next slide, please, Dave. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, Russia has a longstanding um, uh, use of um, criminal proxies in particular. And it's interesting to, to consider for a second the nature of the relationship between a state and its proxies. Um, of course, the United States and other Western countries um, have proxy uh, organizations that carry out state bidding, but usually there's an explicit kind of contractual relationship here, you know, it's outs outsourced to uh, a private cyber security company or a military company, for example, you know, Lockheed Martin, or, you know, there's plenty of examples of non-state um, uh, components of, um, of the, the military industrial complex. But in the Russian context, what we see is rather than these uh, contractual ob obligations um, or arrangements between non-state actors, we see a really heavy emphasis on the use of criminal proxies. Um, so this is using um, uh, mafia diasporas, using organized crime groups um, as uh, what Gagliotti describes here, uh, organized crime groups used as quote, an instrument of statecraft abroad. And these are used to carry out a range of objectives um, that uh, have to do with enriching Russian elites, but also furthering um, uh, different Russian strategic interests overseas. Uh, so we've seen uh, this across a range of different domains, uh, money laundering, trafficking in arms and illicit drugs, political assassinations, um, you know, we've seen this, uh, you know, certainly in the UK, murdering of journalists, putting plutonium in people's teeth. Um, you know, there's been some, some colourful uh, and tragic examples here. Repression of anti-Putin sentiment uh, amongst the Russian diaspora, um, uh, different parts of the world. And uh, of course, as I just mentioned, um, uh, the use of uh, proxy forces, organized crime groups in conventional combat operations. Um, so in Eastern Ukraine, although the Eastern Ukrainian situation is obviously one that's developing uh, now and not one in uh, Russia's strategic favor, but also in Georgia and Chechnya as well. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what has this got to do with ransomware? Uh, well, we know ransomware is, it's the big new cybercrime 
that is uh, gaining people's attention around the world. We're seeing massive growths in cybercrime over the last few years, and not just in frequency, we're also seeing um, increases in the scale and sophistication of these attacks as well. So the attacks are getting bigger, um, uh, they're attacking you know, more diverse range of the targets, uh, and the attacks themselves have gone from these kind of low tech targeting um, of small uh, enterprises to the emergence of big game hunting now. So using quite sophisticated spear phishing, um, and, and other other technical sophisticated technical approaches to compromising these uh, large scale organisations and the infliction of large amounts of damage. So you know, I think this really peaked when we saw the Colonial Pipeline attacks, um, uh, which shut down um, petroleum distribution in the eastern United States. Um, this is of course associated with the rise of ransomware as a service. So we've got ransomware groups that are not only carrying out these attacks directly themselves, but are creating um, ransomware and then selling that to affiliates. And then those affiliates will go out and conduct the attacks themselves, sending a proportion of, uh, of whatever funds they've secured back to, uh, back to the core group. Uh, so, you know, this is the, the big new threat, as I mentioned, uh, and this is being, you know, acknowledged by, you know, groups like Europol, um, you know, uh, the European Crime Centre um, as, yeah, as, as, you know, the, the kind of growing and significant problem. Next slide, please. Now, we know that uh, Russian groups or groups that are believed to be located in Russia or more broadly the Commonwealth of Independent States. So this is, you know, states that used to belong to the Soviet Union. Uh, these are the dominant players when it comes to nearly, you know, nearly all of the, the major ransomware strains have been created by groups that are, are believed to be located in Russia or the CIS. Uh, and there's a range of different mooted explanations for this. Um, you know, we've got poor economic conditions in Russia. Uh, again, this is something that's been exacerbated significantly since, uh, since the Ukraine conflict commenced in earnest a couple of months ago. Uh, there's a historic abundance of skilled IT practitioners. So Russians tend to be good um, uh, in, you know, highly educated in the IT space and STEM more generally. Uh, and then we have minimal local law enforcement. Um, so, you know, local law enforcement, and we're going to talk in, well, actually, we're going to talk in a lot more detail on the next slide about this. But basically, this, this hands off approach from the state has uh, enabled the growth of um, ransomware as an entire industry, as something that can, you know, is, forms a, a component of uh, the Russian shadow economy. Uh, next slide, please, then. So how do Russian, how does the Russian state engage with the uh, with the, the ransomware groups that are located there? Well, really selective law enforcement is the main um, name of the game here. Uh, so ransomware groups um, that operate uh, in Russia or the former CIS, the big discussion here is what they call the one rule more broadly, uh, or the rules of the road. And the rules of the road uh, that are well understood is that you can target whoever you like, as long as it isn't any organization that is in Russia or the broader Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, so we, we know about this through um, cybersecurity firms monitoring uh, Russian darknet forums, you know, ransomware forums. We know about this through interviews with uh, ransomware actors. Uh, and we also know about it by looking at the actual code um, of uh, the top uh, ransomware strains. Uh, and none of the, these codes will actually allow the targeting of Russian uh, systems. So and there's a variety of ways they do this. For example, um, uh, uh, IP addresses that have a Russian location or one within the CIS uh, will preclude the, the code from working, um, the code won't attack uh, systems that have a Russian keyboard layout or Russian language format. Um, and we know that Russian law enforcement, almost exclusively, there are exceptions, but they avoid prosecuting groups that stick to the one rule. Um, so if you're you know, targeting foreign organizations, particularly those within uh, the West, the United States, Australia, Canada, and so on, then you basically got nothing to fear. There were some exceptions here, and we saw a rather high profile one. Um, we had members of Darkside um, uh, arrested after the attack on the JBS Meatworks, which hit Canada, Australia. Um, a very significant attack um, uh, and uh, one that happened quite close in proximity to the colonial pipeline attacks as well. But this happened after direct intervention from uh, the US in particular, the Biden um, administration. 
Um, but basically Russian ransomware groups, you know, have little fear from local law enforcement unless they make the mistake of targeting um, local organizations, which uh, in the few instances where they do, they tend to be arrested very quickly uh, and publicly um, made an example of. So what this demonstrates is that Russian law enforcement don't lack the capability to target ransomware actors that are operating within their territory, um, but, uh, but rather um, uh, choose not to do so when it is deemed to be in their interests. Uh, so next slide, please, Dave. So <clears throat> taking all this uh, information um, uh, together, what we would argue uh, is that rather than having this clear continuum between private criminal activity on the one hand and state activity on the other, what we argue is <clears throat> that uh, we've actually got private criminal actors. So, you know, we're not arguing that the Russian state uh, has set up these groups or even has you know explicit agreements with them but rather the agreement between the russian state and private ransomware groups the, uh, the criminal actors that are operating in their territory uh, is influenced by selective law enforcement and this is overt signaling on, on the part of the russian state as to who you're allowed to attack and what kind of targets you're allowed to attack so you're allowed to attack anything outside the commonwealth of independent states and you can go for any target as long as it doesn't risk escalation. Uh, so we would argue that the colonial pipeline attacks and the JBS attacks attracted the attention of the Russian state and the ire of Russian law enforcement precisely because they risked escalation. Uh, they violated this salami slicing tactic um, component um, uh, of grey zone warfare. Uh, so rather than yeah, groups having an explicit um, control or memorandum of understanding, rather that uh, these private criminal actors are influenced by this selective law enforcement. Um, so this is the way of the Russian state um, essentially controlling the groups that are operating in their territory so they can go out and do their bidding. Um, and there are a range of benefits that this brings to the Russian state. Um, so next slide, please, David. So the benefits that it brings to the Russian state is the enrichment of the local economy. So if you've got Russian ransomware uh, actors that are going out um, and exfiltrating money from rival states, um, so, you know, in the form of uh, ransom, they're bringing that money back into Russia. That obviously brings benefit and probably one, uh, although we don't have proof of this, that is being passed on to ruling elites as well. We imagine they're getting their, their cut because that's the way the Russian state engages with organized crime more broadly. Uh, another benefit, of course, is it brings direct economic damage, um, disruption and embarrassment to strategic rivals. Uh, so, you know, shutting down businesses, uh, you know, causing havoc, causing mayhem, um, and also particularly um, the imposition of costs through the development of cybersecurity. So, you know, forcing onto um, private uh, commercial uh, organizations, but also state organizations as well, the necessity to develop more and more sophisticated cybersecurity resources is a very significant cost here. Uh, the other benefits that we have here for the Russian state is they didn't need to pay for any of this, okay? They didn't need to, you know, set up these, these ransomware groups themselves. There's no fee that they need to pay. There's no training that the state itself needs to provide. Uh, so it's a cheap and effective way to, um, to augment your lack of conventional power in the cyber sphere by co-opting these uh, rival groups, uh, these, these private criminal groups in much the same way, we would argue as historical navies supplemented their, well, historical states supplemented their lack of naval power through the uh, incorporation of privateers into their force. And this helps compensate for power asymmetries with rival states. Of course, this can all be done, uh, or this can all be denied, which enables plausible deniability on the part of the Russians and helps avoid escalation into outright conflict as well. Uh, right, and final slide, please. Okay, so in, uh, in wrapping this up, we know that ransomware is on the rise globally. It's increasing in frequency and intensity, and we know that much of this activity is con concentrated amongst groups that are located in Russia or in satellite states. We argue that uh, Russia exercises de facto control of these groups, or at least many of these groups, through selective law enforcement. Um, this is essentially you know, the, the, the letter of mark that we would um, uh, consider um, as historical states controlling their digital privateers, but there's no such overt uh, arrangement between 
uh, contemporary Russian ransomware groups uh, and the Russian state. Um, the quid pro quo is that the Russian state offers safe haven in return for this targeting uh, of their foreign adversaries and the various harm that it inflicts on those rival states. So what we argue here uh, and the utility of um, approaching ransomware as digital privateering and as a form of state crime is that um, it changes the kinds of solutions that we'd be looking for. Instead of looking for law enforcement solutions, instead we argue that solutions should be focused in a general sense on the imposition of costs on the Russian state because they're the true enablers of uh, this kind of uh, cybercrime. Uh, and I'll probably leave it there. I'm happy to open it up to questions. Thank you, James. Very, very interesting. We uh, saw a lot of uh, activity occur in response to the arrests of uh, members of Revel. And uh, more recently, we've seen the kind of uh, leaks coming out of the Conti group uh, in response to the activities in Ukraine. And within that, there's been some discussion about concern amongst members that might have been surprised by the activities taken against Revel by Russia. Uh, we have seen from some of those chats that it may not be members of the core group, it may be affiliates of Revel that were actually the targets of the operation. I think that remains to be seen in terms of what, uh, at what outcomes come from any criminal justice measures. I guess, uh, I'm interested. We will talk more uh, with David's talk uh, about the groups themselves, so we don't need to get into that just now. But at, I guess from your perspective, looking back at the idea of digital privateering, at what point uh, would you expect a state to intervene against members of a group? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and it points to, you know, we've talked a lot about the benefits to the Russian state. Um, that are associated with digital privateering, that it, you know, it's basically a, a, a cheap, you know, free and easy way to augment your, um, your, your conventional forces um, and you, you've got your plausible deniability. Um, but I guess the, the big sort of problem that comes with this as well is because these groups are controlled at a distance and they're controlled through the use of a relatively blunt tool, which is selective law enforcement. I mean, there may be other, you know, covert conversations that are happening between the Russian state and these groups, we don't know. Um, so we don't have that central to our analysis, but we do know that they're using selective law enforcement. And this sends a very clear signal as to what's allowed and what's not. Um, and when we see um, when the Russian state has intervened, it's been in these very large cases that have prompted some kind of escalatory response from the United States. So Colonial Pipeline was a really you know good example here. Um, you know, it shut down um, uh, petrol distribution in the US caused massive disruption. Disruption. It hit critical systems, right? And uh, it it not only risked escalation. I mean, it it actually prompted escalation. We saw, you know, President Biden was very upset about this. There was a setup um, of a, a special task force by the White House. Um, you know, there were very proactive responses, and there were offensive cyber operations um, as well. Um, and so, you know, the problem here, and we saw this in the case with historical privateers as well, is a lack of control. When you've got proxy forces that are controlled at a distance, then that really precise targeting, the calibration of targets in such a way that you've got salami slicing taking place and it's incremental, none of it's too big, you know, it sits in that sort of nice Goldilocks zone of targeting, is difficult to, to coordinate. And so uh, we would argue that the big scale attacks, JBS, colonial pipeline attacks, far from being successful ransomware attacks, actually from this perspective, they weren't successful because they were too big. Um, and they started crossing red lines and crossing an escalatory threshold that brought negative attention towards the Russian state. And in the end, that's what the Russian state, you know, cares about. It's not, you know, these groups themselves, but themselves, you know, staying, you know, flying under the radar. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, what you mentioned about the, the historical privateers, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about how that might shed light on resolving the ransomware problem at the moment. Mm -hmm. Could you reflect a little bit more on, on how that was addressed, you know, historically? Yeah, so um, I think one of the ways we approach <clears throat> ransomware, <clears throat> pardon me, and cybercrime more generally is from this cybersecurity perspective. We're like, oh, okay, well, if we've got perfect cybersecurity, or, you know, at least really robust cybersecurity and, you know, more and more target hardening, uh, then, you know, then these problems might be able to, to go away or at least become much more manageable. 
if we looked at that, you know, sort of extended that to, to, to the analogy that we're using with these privateering vessels, that would be the equivalent of putting more and more guns on these Spanish vessels that are laden with gold trying to make their way, you know, back to the European mainland. Um, and while some of those ships had significant defences, it's not, it's not what actually stopped privateering in the end. And the reason for that is the strategic environment of, you know, the 17th and 18th century ocean favoured attackers. And I would argue that it favours attackers in a similar way as we see with um, the contemporary internet, um, where you can have, you know, attackers from all over the world. Um, uh, there are vulnerabilities and exposures that, you, yes, you can minimise, but you can't necessarily eliminate. Um, so it, it favours, uh, I think, offensive operations over defence. Um, uh, but, you know, cybersecurity professionals can, you know, have, have their own um, take on that. I'm sure they'll have their own take on that. Um, instead, historical privateering wasn't solved by increasing the defences of individual merchant vessels. It was solved through the imposition of costs on those states that provided safe havens for privateers. Uh, and there are a few ways that was done, you know, in very dramatic circumstances, some, sometimes through, you know, really direct military conflict. So the United States declared war on, um, on uh, the, the states that were hosting the, the Barbary uh, Coast pirates. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it suggests that we need to, to, look, to turn away from uh, static defensive operations and instead look at ways that we can impose costs on the states that enable these, uh, the, the privateering attacks to take place. So I think that's where that's one of the, the important you know, things from this analogy is it shifts our attention away, even from the ransomware groups themselves, uh, because they're not the ones ultimately responsible. It's the Russian state that is, that is providing the environment that these groups can, can safely operate in. Hmm. Um, what about if we broaden out from ransomware for the moment and think about a range of other cyber related activities and what's going on? You mentioned the theft of uh, intellectual property during the talk. Uh, to what extent does this concept potentially shed light on on those sort of activities as well? Uh, yeah, I think it can be can be readily extended to, to that. You know, we, we've kept the analysis here relatively um, relatively focused on on Russia and on ransomware because well, because so much ransomware comes out of Russia, and we have all this other evidence about how Russia uses criminal groups to further its its interests abroad. And so this is sort of you know it's a, it's a relatively easy conceptual. Um, uh, a step to make to, to start to say, okay, well, they're, they're doing this online as well. And they're, you know, they're extending their activities there, but I think you could, you could easily make the case, um, uh, you know, in the, in the Chinese example, you know, if there are non-state actors that are going out and essentially, you know, doing the state's bidding, you know, bringing in intellectual property. And the thing about this, the theft of intellectual property as well, is it seems to be, um, well, it has a, has a much less, uh, I think it risks escalation um, uh, or controls the risk of, of escalation much better than um, ransomware attacks do because it's not as disruptive. Um, you know, the benefits um, for a state in stealing intellectual property means that you can, you know, you can set up advanced manufacturing facilities. You don't need to conduct research and development yourself. Um, but critically, it doesn't shut down any of the rival state that you're targeting um, in a way that causes embarrassment. You know, it can be done much more easily in a covert sense. Um, and, you, you know, you're not getting, you know, angry drivers piling up, not being able to fill, fill up their cars, you know, which is going to demand, a, you know, a proactive response from politicians. So I think it's, you know, it's a kind of stealthy, you know, digital privateering uh, that's taking place. But I, I think the, the analogy still, still can apply there for sure. It's, it's really interesting to, to think about that for a moment when, you know, ransomware, as big as it is and as much as it's grown, is still nowhere near the size of, I guess, the economic problem that the theft of IP uh, might be. We've seen, you know, any number of figures thrown around about that, most of them number in the trillions of dollars. Mm. Uh, so one would expect, uh, just looking at the costs, that... The, the risk of escalation might be greater in the field of IP, but I think you've made a really compelling point that uh, ransomware is just more disruptive and, and makes more noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think 
I think the last thing we might want to just reflect on a little bit more on this talk before we move on to the next one might be that that point about escalation. You know, why why is it really uh, only until we saw the pipeline attacks and and yeah, JBS was was around the same time that I think it's probably um, it it on its own might not have led to the outcome that it did uh, because it happened in such pro close proximity to the to the dark side uh, attack as well and the believed relationships between the two groups might have led to the concerns uh, from from the us at least being as strong as they were why aren't we seeing more of this uh, escalate uh, into you know a higher level conflict or you know a, a stronger response by states such as such as the us uh, more recently uh well i think this is this is where the real genius of gray zone warfare comes in um you know with i mean there's other analogies you can use here you know death of a thousand cuts or you know it's the it's the frog in the slowly boiling pot you know when you inflict this damage in small amounts over time and particularly because there's you know the state the state yes has a responsibility to provide security for you know, people and organizations that operate within that state. You know, if there was, if there were Russian, you know, organized crime, you know, commandos breaking into these institutes, you know, breaking into US banks, stealing things or, you know, kidnapping people and demanding ransom, if they were using, you know, kinetic force, physical force, there would be a huge and immediate outcry. But in the online space, we just don't see that either. Um, you know, the, the threats that, that emanate from, uh, I mean, you know, this is this is a problem more more generally that we see in criminology. You know, white collar crimes, cyber crimes, just do not attract the same level of they don't arouse the same level of fear amongst the public and, and anxiety, despite the fact that they come with these huge costs. Um, and rather than the state providing security like it does in a physical sense, mm -hmm. the state has outsourced that responsibility online in the West to cybersecurity firms. You know, every firm is considered to you know you need to take care of yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the state has traditionally had a you know, hands-off approach to, to securing the, the security and welfare of its citizens and its, and its, and its you know, organizations and you know, businesses online. Um, I think we, we just generally as humans aren't conditioned to be as alarmed by crimes that take place online as opposed to physical threats around us. And particularly so when those attacks are deliberately calibrated in such a way as to fall under a threshold of seriousness. You know, if they're not just dis disrupting our daily lives, who cares what's happening in the building next to us here? Or, you know, it, it's it's it all seems a bit too, you know, vague and amorphous a threat to really catalyze any kind of action. And the argument we're making here is that's not an accident. That that's actually a deliberate intended feature of this strategy is it's all designed to obfuscate um, and to and to and to deliberately fall under the, you know, those triggers that would prompt some kind of serious uh, response. Mm. Well, very interesting. Uh, and I think we will pick up on a similar theme or at least pull on some similar threads uh, as we move on to the next talk where we're going to uh, focus on, on some of the groups themselves. So I'm going to uh, shoot over to my colleague on, on my left, your right, uh, David Bright, over to you. All okay. right. Thanks, Chad. Uh, good to be here. Thank you for being here wherever you might be. Uh, so this talk um, takes a slightly different perspective on ransomware groups uh, and it's entitled Exploring the Hidden Structure of Criminal Groups Conducting Ransomware Attacks. We, we see this as being an ongoing long-term program of research uh, and so what we're outlining today is just one small part or one beginning step of our, of our pathway through that program of research um, and this smaller project um, focuses on, at least in the first instance, on um, Australia. I think it's fair to say that the that the project, that what, what, what I'll be presenting today is really just some, some conceptual um, issues that will help us to, to explore the, the hidden structure of these groups. And these um, concepts are really drawn from two main areas. Firstly, from networks from network theory and from uh, social network analysis and secondly from what we know uh, or what we can draw or analogies that we can draw from um, studying organized crime groups in what we might call the real world so 
uh, we think that there are probably ways to draw some uh, connections around what we know about organised crime groups and, and how um, ransomware groups might might organise themselves and organise the way that they go about their activities. So the, the aims of this, this smaller beginning project, but, but I think fair to say that the aims of, of the program of research that we envisaged over time um, are these, to, to analyse the formation, the evolution and the lifespan of ransomware criminal groups. And we'll dig into that a bit more through this presentation. And to reveal hidden connections among these groups and their activities in terms of both conducting these ransomware attacks, but also groups that provide ransomware as a service. Um, and we're going to be doing this by using uh, network theory, but using social network analysis to help us to, to make some of these connections and to understand this evolution uh, in a sort of deeper way. Uh, and, and in this in this presentation, we'll be talking a bit about how we propose to do that. Um, we don't have data at this point, um, but, but we will be talking a bit about what we intend to do and, and how we might go about it. So I guess the starting point is why we might use networks as a way to um, understand some of these groups and as a way to, to examine the structure of these groups. Uh, and I'll just go through some of these. This is not exhaustive at all, and there's, I think, a lot to unpack here. I'm going to try to allow for the contributions of my colleagues as we go. So um, rather than this just being me talking, if there are, if there are um, contributions that uh, my colleagues in the room want to make, I'll try and make time for that. We'll not talk so much that they don't get a chance to say anything. So um, yeah, this is not an exhaustive list of, of, of the network approach. And I should say that I'm doing purposefully conflating two things in this slide. Um, I'm conflating both why we would use a network approach to understand these groups, but also <coughs> why these groups might benefit from organising as a network. They're two kind of separate but, but related issues. Um, um, I'm sort of doing this on purpose, partly for time and partly because they they are um, two very, very connected issues. So firstly, networks are, are resilient. There's something about the structure of networks that, that makes that type of structure particularly resilient, um, for example, to attack by, by law enforcement. Uh, just to give you one example of that resilience is that networks can include redundant ties, ties that um, serve the same purpose across the network. And if you remove one of those ties or some of those individuals, there would be other individuals and other ties in the network that serve the same function and can allow the network to continue and not just kind of fall apart. The structure of networks can facilitate both learning um, and passing that those learnings, whether it be about strategy, about how to avoid law enforcement detection through the network, and can also facilitate the sharing of, of resources through the network. Um, Similarly, networks can allow for individuals to develop particular roles or skills and contribute those roles and skills to the benefit of the entire network. And we see that particularly in, in organised crime groups where there might be particular roles like, say, a money launderer who serves a particular purpose or plays a particular role in the network. Networks can facilitate trust um, and can facilitate trust throughout the network. Uh, again, an example of this relating back to the structure of networks, uh, what are known as triadic structures within networks or, or triangles between, say, three individuals in a network. And those tightly clustered um, triangular type structures in a network can facilitate trust within a network, particularly a network that's operating in an illicit context where, where trust is, is difficult to gauge and difficult to maintain. Network boundaries can be impermeable to outside influence. They cannot allow information in, um, but they can also be quite permeable and can allow uh, information both, both in and out of the network. So depending on the structure, uh, th these boundaries can be both permeable and impermeable, and that has implications for the functioning of uh, 
a group like a ransomware group or an organized crime group that's existing in an illicit context. Networks can, can also facilitate what, what we know of as strategic positioning. And again, drawing this from the organized crime literature, uh, we know that there are some individuals within networks who are, do not have a, a very large number, a very high number of connections to other individuals, um, but they have what, what we would call strategic connections. Um, we would know some of these as brokers, individuals who sit between different parts of a network, connect otherwise disconnected parts of a network. And these are particularly strategic positions within a network. And those the individuals who, who hold those positions tend to benefit um, in terms of both social capital, but also in terms of um, financially from being in those positions. Uh, and so we, we were interested in, in examining this type of strategic positioning from the perspective of ransomware groups. Networks are adaptable. They can respond very quickly and in an agile manner to changes in their environment. Um, we see this in, in organisational um, studies, but we also see it in the organised crime space, that networks can um, fairly quickly change their shape, change their structure, add new ties, add new individuals to the network in order to respond to um, challenges in the environment, including law enforcement interventions that seek to break the network apart. Uh, and finally, a network perspective can help to predict, but also explain different types of disruption. Uh, and again, we draw this from the organised crime literature. There's, there's a reasonable amount in the organised crime space around both detecting areas of vulnerability in networks, but also understanding um, the extent to which law enforcement interventions can disrupt and dismantle networks. Uh, just a little bit on theory. So um, there are so so network theory really is, um, we would argue is a is a, a very large theoretical perspective that draws from a number of different spaces. But um, we won't try and be exhaustive right now. We'll just talk about one very specific but very applicable theory to the space that we're, we're talking about, and that's this network, network capital framework. Um, network capital framework suggests that there are two types of capital within networks, uh, and we'll be applying these types of capital to the ransomware space. So the first is human capital. So what do individuals or groups have in terms of or possess in terms of skills or knowledge? And in the case of ransomware groups, these types of human, this type of human capital might include skills with respect to coding, um, creating malware, uh, and it may include um, negotiation skills. So um, skills for negotiating with victims around the payment of the ransom that's been demanded by the group. And secondly, social capital, which is really about the interconnections between uh, individuals or between groups. This includes the strategic positioning that I've talked about previously, but it also incorporates the ability of these different types of ties or connections to people or to groups that have particular knowledge or particular skills. And we know that ransomware groups will seek out, will recruit, individuals with, with key skills, whether that be for uh, computer coding or creating malware, or whether it's negotiation skills, or whether it's skills in money laundering or a range of other services that these groups require. So the, the, the study that I've, I've talked about, this initial sort of study that we've started working on um, as a precursor to more work, is focused on some Australian-based um, case studies. Uh, three of those are the Cyber Spider Group, which was allegedly behind the ransomware attack on the Toll Group in February 2020. The Nephilim Group, um, which only a few months later attacked Toll again in 2020. And then the Revil Group, uh, identified by the FBI as responsible for attacks on JDS Foods in 2021, and United Care Queensland uh, in 2021 also. So the idea of our, of our project and our ongoing work 
is to use these groups as case studies and to seek to find interconnections between the groups uh, on the basis of a number of different characteristics. Um, now, those characteristics might be the type of malware they use, it might be the type of um, communication or different strategies for negotiation that they use, it might be the language that they use uh, online and through those negotiations. So there are a number of ways that we believe we can find uh, evidence for interconnections between these groups. Um, and as I move on through the next few slides, you'll see other ways that we intend to do that. So in the next, in the last few slides that I have, we're just going to focus in on the Revil group as a, as a sort of specific case study. So the Revil group operated from around June 2019 to October of 2021. Uh, it's engaged in a number of different attacks uh, against a, a range of entities. Um, some of those are listed there. They're believed to be based in Russia and Eastern Europe, as James described earlier. Uh, and they are known to be a ransomware as a service uh, entity. Um, so these entities are comprised of a sort of a core group of individuals who are responsible for the operation of the group itself. Uh, and then affiliates who are uh, basically contracted to seek victims and to engage in attacks and are paid a, a specific proportion of the ransom, something like 70% of the, the ransom uh, is usually paid to the affiliates and they're promised that in advance. We've uh, extracted just from some open source data, some a, a brief timeline of the lifespan of, um, of Revil. We'll talk a bit more about this in the next few slides. There's a lot here, but, but really the takeaway, um, if you look at some of the different data points on this timeline, is that you see some overlap between the activities of four ostensibly different ransomware groups. The GAN Crab group at the left-hand side of the timeline uh, then we see Revil start operating about a third of the way through. Um, we then see a group called Darkside um, commencing their attacks um, just past the halfway point. Uh, and then we see Black Matter, the Black Matter group, um, appear towards the end of, the, um, of that timeline there. Now, what we know or what we um, what we think we know about these groups is that they will transform themselves to um, avoid law enforcement intervention. They'll transform themselves into different groups. They'll fake their demise. They'll, um, they, they will fake their retirement and then potentially re-emerge in different, either in different forms or with different names. Um, so there's some suggestion, particularly among intelligence analysts, that, that these groups have morphed over time um, and include either affiliates or, or core members uh, throughout time. I think it might be worth just pausing on that for a moment yeah, and, sure. uh, and pull on some of those threads because it relates to James's talk as well. Um, clearly, you know, we see one group, yeah, in this case, Gan Crab, uh, which uh, based on all available evidence had a pretty successful but short life. Uh, it, it conducted a, a fair amount of operations during its life and then uh, retired and uh, we don't know what happened to the certainly the core members of the group so the core affiliate uh, structure is, is quite interesting to think about particularly from a network perspective and i know you're going to get to that but we see uh, revel emerge and many have uh, discuss some of the links between Gan Crab and, and Revil, certainly in terms of the variants um, and the tactics and, and code and, and so on. So uh, we don't know whether it was core members of Gan Crab which went off to start Revil or if it was an affiliate who attracted or, or, or had mm. some of the, 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 the code and, and the relationships and went off and started this uh, separate group. We're seeing similar links uh, be uh, established between Revil and Darkside, and uh, quite interestingly, both of those groups, however, responded quite differently to the pressure coming from 
the United States uh, in response to, well, the, the trigger points that we discussed, the JBS mm -hmm. attacks and the uh, colonial pipeline, whereas uh, both of them disappeared pretty quickly and went into hiding. There was widespread discussion about whether their operations were shut down or whether they took them offline themselves. We don't know, uh, but if, if they were shut down, uh, you'd probably expect Certainly, if they were shut down by the United States, why wouldn't they have mm. uh, been on upfront about that? We don't, we don't know. So they may well have been taken down by themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, dark side stayed dark, mm -hmm. and uh, Revil uh, re-emerged pretty quickly thereafter, uh, almost, almost taunting the US, uh, if you like. And I think that probably was one of the additional reasons why there was a more escalation uh, heading toward Revil, where analysts have been pretty quick to draw connections between dark side and black matter. So all of this is quite interesting to just uh, trace certainly the evolution and the careers of these criminal groups and how they might be related to one another. Let's uh, kind of keep that in mind as we continue the discussion from this point forward. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Yeah, and I mean, as Chad mentioned, we, we read in analyst reports uh, and, and, and other types of um, government reports around the, the potential connections between these groups. What we're hoping to do in, in this study and, and further work is to take a more systematic and a networked approach to those questions to expose those potential interconnections between these groups to greater scrutiny. Mm. Uh, so just expanding on that a little further, um, we know that a, a sort of a core periphery type structure is, is common in other types of, of organised crime groups. And we understand that that type of structure has particular advantages with respect to both the resilience of those, those groups and that those networks, but also with respect to the capacity of those groups to communicate efficiently, but at the same time to um, enhance their security when it comes to either attacks by other groups or attacks by um, law enforcement and intelligence agencies. Um, and what we see in these ransomware groups is this core periphery type structure. So as mentioned previously, we have the core group who are the individuals who direct the activities of the group provide the um, ransomware code or the malware to the affiliates. Uh, and then the affiliates who are recruited by the group to undertake the ransomware attacks. Um, the core group in their recruitment um, uh, strategy will often specifically advertise on underground forums for particular types of technical skills. Um, and so those affiliates are responsible for seeking out the victims, for identifying potential data breaches, undertaking the attack themselves. Um, and then uh, the core group will provide support with respect to negotiation. And we know or we expect or anticipate that we'll see within these networks different types of roles, including uh, negotiators who will be negotiating with victims for the payment of the ransom. Um, but also, as we've mentioned before, uh, money laundering type roles uh, will be required as well. And, and that's, a, I think, another good example of how we are anticipating some similar structures and similar roles that we have seen previously in uh, organised crime type groups in the offline space. We're anticipating seeing those types of roles uh, in ransomware groups, given that the motivation of these groups is very similar to that of, of uh, organised crime groups. Just a little bit on, on uh, what we anticipate that we'll be looking for with respect to connections or ties between um, different entities in the network. The first will be connections between the groups. And I think we've, we've talked a bit about the potential for connections between groups, whether it's similar membership, uh, similar strategies, similar malware code that's being used. We're anticipating that we'll be able to map out some of the connections between these groups over time. Uh, we'll obviously be able to connect the ransomware groups to different victims 
Uh, and that may be another way that we can identify um, similarities in the way that some of these groups are operating. But we also are um, planning to use ties in the network to identify a variety of different attack vectors. So a way to look at the specific methods used by these groups, phishing attacks, the use of exploit kits uh, and the like, um, and whether there are similarities between these groups in their use of attack vectors. And again, whether that shifts across time as well. And speaking of time, one of the other big advantages of using a network approach is that we can look at the temporal dynamics of networks over time to look at the way the network shifts and changes over time, whether that's in response to Sorry, um, whether whether that was Siri wanting to get involved, whether there are uh, different, um, there are changes in over time with response in response to competition from other groups, hmm. whether those changes are in response to law enforcement and intelligence attacks on the groups. And we've already mentioned that what we what we may see is, and what has been in, uh, suggested in some of the reports, in, intelligence reports online is that GAN crab, uh, that some of the affiliates of GAN crab became the core of evil, that perhaps affiliates or the core of evil became dark side and then and then shifted into black matter. So that'll be one of the, the key kind of areas that we investigate in some of the work that we're doing using this network approach. Uh, with respect to temporal dynamics uh, of networks, we also know that, and I've mentioned previously that these groups recruit for affiliates with particular types of skills, whether they're technical skills around malware production or whether they're people skills. Uh, and these people that this is actually a quote from a from an advertisement uh, by one of these groups for affiliates. They're looking for someone with people skills, someone to conduct some of these negotiations with victims. <coughs> uh, so we'll be using some social network um, approaches to take a close look at some of these temporal dynamics of the connections between these groups across time. And finally, uh, networks can be used, as I mentioned previously, to understand both um, ways to disrupt or ways to dismantle these groups, um, but also to understand how disruption occurs. Uh, and again, applying our knowledge of organised crime groups to ransomware groups, we know that there are at least two different um, categories of disruption. A group can be disrupted or can be dismantled due to internal disputes, and we've, we've seen that in the organised crime space. But we also know that there have been disputes between affiliates and core group members uh, in the case of ransomware groups. In fact, there's been some suggestion that a, a particular dispute between an affiliate and, and core group may have led to the demise of Revil. Um, and then secondly, intelligence uh, interventions or law enforcement interventions uh, against these groups may uh, disrupt the groups as well. And we'll be looking at, at particular areas of vulnerability, um, particular uh, interventions that might be more or less disruptive for these groups based on our, our network approach. And I yeah. think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. And we have uh, some time left to pull on some of these threads. So the um, first one we will pull on is a question from uh, one of the uh, participants, which is just asking us really to clarify how we are defining network and how that differentiates from the term group and i think in their mind might be the idea of using network more in a metaphorical sense and you know there's this dark net and then you know communities network communities and so on so Jay, yeah want to share? yeah sure so that's a great question and kind of key to, to a lot of the work we've done previously <clears throat> in in the organized crime and terrorism space but but really key to this project as well uh, network can can definitely be used, you know, as, as more of a, a metaphorical term for an entity, uh, but we are using it, I think, in a, in a more specific uh, term with respect to a type of analytical approach. So social network analysis really seeks to um, 
understand groups, whatever those groups are, whether they're groups of individuals, whether they're groups of um, organisations, or in this case, um, ransomware groups, by identifying um, what we might call nodes, so actors, those actors can be groups, they can be individuals, and connections between those nodes, which we, we call ties. So in this particular case, in the case of this project, we are using network um, as a very specific label, um, using social network analysis to understand the structure of these groups, their connections to each other, their connections to victims. Uh, and as I mentioned during the talk, we'll be using ties as a way to understand the different types of strategies, attack strategies that these groups are using. Mm -hmm. So I hope, hope that, that answers that question. I can certainly talk more about that if needed. Ah, thanks. So I want to talk a little bit about the broader kind of research literature around organised crime, stuff that we've yeah. engaged with uh, a fair bit and, and relatively recently. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that the idea of uh, organised cyber crime was, was uh, critiqued quite heavily and there was very little evidence uh, empirically supporting the idea uh, outside of very narrow fields and i think the rise of ransomware groups and ransomware as a service has has certainly challenged that conception uh that's our contention anyway mm. we've, we've seen a lot of these groups flourish uh, quite quickly to become very serious players and i think james's talk around digital privateers uh, provides a lot of explanatory context at least potentially in terms of how they've been able to flourish so quickly and and uh, get to the level that they're at now. What do you think the uh, broad research literature around organised crime might have to offer when we think about cyber organised crime today? Yeah, it's a big question, um, but I, but I think I think it's really central to the to the project that we're working on here, and I think we need to grapple with that issue. So. So just to, I guess, to throw out a few ideas, one, one would be that, you know, in the organised crime space, we, we talk a lot about the difference between and the, and the relationship between networks and, and markets, for example. So um, the networks of organised crime groups and markets for particular goods, whether they be um, illicit drugs, firearms, uh, whatever they might be. And so I think that's the first that's the first area of kind of similarity that what we're talking about here are networks operating in markets. Those markets happen to exist on the, on the internet rather than in the real world. But so I think that, that, that that's the first kind of area that I think needs, needs to be addressed or thought through more clearly than I'm thinking it through right now. Um, and then the other areas would be in no particular order, you know, one would be the, the motivation of the groups. So organised crime groups are broadly motivated by, um, by financial gain, but we also know that individuals who engage in organised crime are benefiting in other ways. There are, there are social capital, there's a social capital gain for individuals who, who engage in organised crime, um, whether that's um, notoriety or whether it's just um, uh, social capital within the group that they exist in, whatever, whatever it might be. And so I think that's another parallel here that these groups are not, they're in the business of making money, but they're also in the business of doing it well and, and gaining notoriety or being the, the best that they can be in that space. Uh, we've talked a bit about recruitment. I think that's a, that's a really key um, parallel, the way that organised crime groups will recruit for particular skills or particular roles and the way that ransomware groups do. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one more thing, and that's um, we know that in the organised crime world or in the, in the world of crime more broadly, um, there, are these, there are these settings that criminologists call convergent settings, which are area, uh, places that um, individuals can meet to seek out particular types of skills or to seek out co-offenders. Um, in the real world, there are things like gyms or pubs or jails, prisons. Um, and I think we need to think through what the conversion settings are in the case of ransomware groups. Um, so they're just a few just off the top mm. of the head about what, what, what types of um, 
similarities that there would be, but there'd be, I think there's probably a lot more than that. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, yeah, okay. I think uh, there'd be uh, a lot of thought on each of those, the convergence settings, the, the online mm -hmm. um, forums and, and communities that you know, have been researched in, in drug markets and mm -hmm. obviously uh, in, in hacking forums and others would be really key there uh, in terms of that synergy to the physical and the digital. Mm -hmm. uh, recruitment is probably worth thinking about that a little bit mm -hmm. more. That you know, We've seen some pretty interesting evidence that these groups are really uh, going out of their way to try to recruit talented people, the ones that they need. And there's a lot of competition for those individuals that you've seen some groups that might uh, you know, try to exacerbate their success uh, in order to attract affiliates mm -hmm. that they think uh, will help them grow or you know grow in terms of their revenues or numbers of attacks. Uh, they've offered more or a greater percentage of uh, revenue from from attacks it might be 60, 70, 80 percent going to the affiliates and 10, 20 or 30 percent going back to the core group. Yeah. Uh, it's been you know quite interesting to see just the the level of effort that some of these entities are going to to attract people to them because of the competition in this space. Um, yeah. And I want to reflect a little bit on motivations. Can I just, too. Can I just come in on the oh, absolutely on that. Go. so that one of the interesting things perhaps around that is that what, what we what we have seen is that these groups will advertise on. I mean, yeah, they're sure they're, they're sort of dark forums or dark net forums, but for specific skills. Yeah. But what we know in the real world is it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do that. Mm. You can't advertise in the local paper or the mm. career one or something for yeah. <laughs> for those particular skills. And so usually those they would come through a broker or through through a, a trusted intermediary who says, "Oh yeah, I know, I know you need these skills. I know, you know, whatever mm -hmm. some guy over here who, who can provide those." But so it'd be interesting to look at, um, yeah, I guess the 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 comparison between those types of those types of forums. Well, I guess that's an interesting yeah. thing to think about in terms of criminal organisations that are trying to focus on longevity and survival. Uh, so they'll grow small uh, very slowly and through trusted parties. Yeah. Whereas you've got, we've already talked about the speed at which ransomware groups have, have, have grown mm. in terms of size and, and number of uh, at scale. So they might be uh, yeah, trying to grow quickly. So some of those other checks and balances that might have gone on in the physical world just that there isn't time yeah. uh, and yeah. the kind of friends of friends in and uh, trusted uh, third person's approach may not be feasible if they want to grow yeah yeah some of the job advertisements seem like they are uh, looking for people yep. in, in a very similar manner to what a corporation might be looking for Yep. In terms of listing skills, they, they're listing the technical skills they need. They, they, they want them to be penetration testing and, yeah. and these particular tools and have experience in these methods and, of course, speak English and have good people skills and so on. Uh, and what's, this, what's, the, what's the way that they are credentialing or checking on people's credentials? At, you know, that's what a good question. Parallel? I've, got, I've got a connected question, if you don't mind if I jump in, David, and that's... <clears throat> um, we were talking about social capital um, earlier in these networks, and I was wondering there about possible connections to the state, you know, particularly the Russian state. And mm -hmm. this seems to be maybe a similar kind of thing here when you're talking about recruitment. Um, I believe there's some evidence <clears throat> that people who have been in, in ransomware groups have been drawn from the state or there's been some movement, you know, in between, you know, Russian intelligence and back and forward. Do you think the state, um, maybe not in a formal sense, but could be one of those convergent settings or could play some role in, you know, in the brokering because they're the ones who, you know, I guess are across in some way all of these different groups. They're a unifying, you know, presence in some way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if we're in the business <coughs> of making those parallels to organised crime, I guess, you know, looking at something like corruption and the way that particular agencies or agents can be, co-opted by organised crime groups to become involved in one way or another um, 
I mean, that, that's kind of my sort of immediate response to, to the notion of where the state might fit. Mm. And of course, it depends on, you know, you know, there's the, there's the issue of particularly weak states perhaps being uh, more vulnerable, but we know, you know, um, in in countries like Australia, the UK and others, there's we, we know that there are significant issues with corruption and, and connections mm. to organised crime groups. Mm. But I mean, with the Russian state, for example, maybe the Russian state or at members of it, in, you know, intelligence services might be playing more of a coordinating role or at least a brokering mm. role mm -hmm. between different different groups if there's if there's members going in and out of you know yeah. between a group and the fsb or I don't know, just... yeah for sure and i mean you know if they're playing that kind of role as mm. you know we talked about that sort of brokering role as mm. being a way to to kind of disappear to mm. be off the radar but to be in a really strategic position in a network so mm -hmm. yeah it's possible mm. and i mean when we're talking about organized <clears throat> crime any group that's uh, obtained funds illegally is going to need to find a way to claim that money uh, yeah. so that's going to be a very similar protocol to what uh, conventional organized crime groups going to use i mean they need mm -hmm. to launder funds they need to um, hide them through legitimate business in order to be able to spend that money so we're going to see uh, similarities one would expect between organized crime and, and criminal organizations operating online sure in that sense, uh, and they might be going to the same or similar people to do that mm -hmm. as what uh, people would be doing on the in the non-digital or the physical world. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> uh, in terms of motivations, I mean, you touched on some some points in addition to financial motivations, which of course are the key drivers of organised mm -hmm. crime. Uh, I want to reflect a little bit more on on the kind of Conti activities that we saw in response to the activity in Ukraine and, um, you know, Conti sort of certain members of Conti at least threatening to engage in offensive operations against um, adversaries of Russia if they were to try to intervene uh, through cyber activities. And then we mm -hmm. saw the... Uh, you know, protests within the Conti group, whether that was core members or affiliates, we, it's still so much we don't know. Mm. Um, but you can see clearly there's a kind of, at least with some members, a patriotic dimension, a patriotic affiliation to their state, uh, in this case, yeah. Russia, uh, which is alongside or at least in addition to the economic uh, motivations which are driving the activity. I suppose that's not dissimilar to, to other criminal contexts. So yeah, yeah, but th but at the same time, often often the definition of organised crime group is that they they don't have some kind of you know philosophical approach. Mm. System. We, we're there to make money, and and I guess that, that that's one difference you often see in the literature between say organised crime groups and and terrorist groups that the latter tend to be committed to some kind of ideology. So so that so that's interesting in itself mm -hmm. that th this group these groups might sit somewhere in the middle of some type of continuum well on that score i mean we saw conversations uh, emerge post the jbs and the dark side attacks where oh. where the us were considering you know approaching some ransomware groups as the equivalent of terrorist organizations mm. uh, engaging in cyber terrorist operations at least there was some discussion about that and certainly dark side uh, went out of their way to promote the fact that they weren't mm. politically motivated, mm. that they were mm. only interested in making profit. You know, mm. they released their manifesto, yeah, their, their statement, which, <laughs> which kind of uh, tried to distance themselves from being considered a cyber terrorist organisation. Yeah. Yeah. And you saw, or we saw not that long after, uh, Reval didn't seem to care at all, that, uh, or at least certain members of, of Reval didn't care at the label. and. Uh, might have been another reason why mm -hmm. they were cracked down on uh, fairly quickly when they popped their head up again. Mm -hmm. But they were, uh, yeah, taunting that. So you've talked about corruption. Uh, we've talked about money laundering and uh, the relationships in, in or the requirement to embed um, illegally obtained funds in legit legitimate business in order to clean those monies. Uh, talked about recruitment and conversion <clears throat> settings. Uh, we've talked a little bit about roles, 
We've had another question here in relation to the network approach or perspectives, uh -huh. and this is uh, a little broader. It is something I have thought about, actually. Uh, do you believe there is uh, also potential to use a network approach to map the diffusion of innovation between ransomware groups? How some groups innovate in developing new attack uh, or negotiation strategies uh, and how others are good at scaling those innovations? Any thoughts? Yeah, great question. Um, so, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, so, so network the network approach um, has is used across a number of different contexts. I mean, we, we use it in the criminal space, um, but but there are a number of other applications. And one very common application is to look at the diffusion of information or the diffusion of ideas. So, uh, this has been used in the health space uh in education and in a number of different organizational and policy contexts so looking at the diffusion of policies or the diffusion of of ideas or innovation um and so yeah that's sort of a, a longer way of saying most definitely it, obviously as as many of you out there will know if, you, if you're doing research in this space one of the biggest challenges is data so the big challenge there would be getting access to data that would allow one to to make those to to engage with with um, the information that you'd need to draw some of those conclusions from your analysis. Hmm. How would we get data? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that is the big question. Hmm. Do, you, do you want to talk a bit about how we would go about how doing we would that? Go about it? Well, I mean, there are all sorts of tools, I guess, you could use online for. For, for, for in terms of a scraping approach. Um, but even then, I mean, how you trust some of these sources, you need to cross-reference that. Yeah. Uh, we've seen, uh, as we discussed earlier, some of these groups of, well, we don't believe they've been entirely honest in, in terms of being mm. um, objective about their success. <clears throat> you know, they may well have overplayed their hand and have every reason to embellish their this, their kind of reputation and track record in order to try to recruit people because there's a whole lot of competition for affiliates out there and uh, initial access brokers and all the rest. So, uh, I mean, our groups like Reval and others responsible for two, three hundred billion dollars, uh, or is it more like two, three hundred million? Uh, and even then, that's obviously an enormous amount, but is that a realistic yeah. amount? We just have no real easy way of uh of verifying some of their claims and the communication that goes on between individuals as well we can mm -hmm. cross-reference that and look at it um but you're dealing with huge amounts and huge volumes of data uh as as you do that and to try to map kind of the diffusion of innovation broadly as which would be a really worthwhile pursuit would probably uh, need to pull in some computational yeah. uh, capability. I think there are some technical, there's some data challenges, there's some technical analytical challenges. Um, you know, I've said before that that doing so a, a cross-sectional social network analysis mm. in this space is, is difficult enough mm. that, to generate enough data to do your basic sort of cross-sectional analysis over a particular time window is hard, but finding multiple time points being confident about your time stamping across those time points is is another thing entirely so it would be it would be challenging but it is theoretically possible mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, i'm going to talk about the weak state point uh we've seen that conversation we just engaged with mm -hmm. in terms of james floating the connection between maybe the state and representatives of the state acting as brokers. I mean, would we, that aside, we've seen concerns about governance being pretty critical in terms of preventing and controlling organised crime and, you know, terrorism and mm. uh, by extension. What would we expect uh, would be kind of, in terms of a law enforcement approach necessary to to kind of prevent and disrupt some of these activities through an organised crime lens. Yeah, well, that's I guess that's the million dollar question, isn't it? And part of that will be 
will flow from some of the work that we're doing. Um, but, I, but, but to draw from the organised crime space, uh, I think uh, using a network perspective in in law enforcement would be one would be one approach. Um, collecting, uh, you know, being being clear about the types of intelligence one collects and collecting that over a period of time uh, on the groups and on the connections between the groups, um, and I guess seeing these groups from a network perspective, uh, I think can help some of those potential um, effective approaches to, to sort of materialise. Mm. But uh, in terms of specific, very specific approaches, I don't think we're, we're sort of clear on those yet. Uh, unless you were to draw on the same sort of tools that are used, like unexplained wealth provisions and the like to follow the money, as they say. Sure. Yeah. Uh, which again, you know, uh, benefit a lot from the network approaches if you were to, to trace those relationships. But of course, all of that implies that the state is uh, interested in enforcing the law, which yeah. comes back to the point about what to, what to do when when state perhaps is not. <clears throat> exactly. So <laughs> what to do when a state does not. Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> I guess you, you try and look at ways of leveraging pressure um, and this this question was, <clears throat> I guess there were there were more options when we started exploring this because it was before the war in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, you know, now there seems to be very few uh, levers to, to pull that have not already been mm. pulled. Um, so, you know, how do you... And, and, and this is the thing, I mean, ransomware, yes, it's a significant it's a significant problem, but it pales into insignificance when considered, you know, amongst you know, the context of an actual war mm. and, you know, the amount of damage and, you know, harm to individuals um, that happens there. So how do you, you know, how do you leverage costs on on a state that is already, you know, being sort of pushed to its its limit? There's There's very few places to go. I think we're between a rock and a hard place there. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's some, I mean, one of the things I'm curious about is how the United States, after the colonial pipeline attacks, managed to recover um, the vast majority of the ransom that they paid. It was, mm. it was you know, it was like mm. four-fifths of the, of the mm. ransom, maybe more, came back. I'd love to know how they did that. And if there are other technical, you know, sort of means by which you could blunt some of these attacks you know if you could mm. reduce the amount of money going into it then you're going to suck you know suck huge amounts of profitability out of that um and perhaps that's you know perhaps that's a way forward maybe there needs to be more offensive cyber operations taking place that raise the cost mm. or impose more costs on mm -hmm. the actors involved um because it looks like our original idea where you go okay well let's let's target the the elites that provide the safe haven there mm. doesn't look like we have many options there mm. um, because of the war. So, mm. you know, maybe we need to start looking, looking in other places, blockchain analysis, you know, mm. ways to, to get those funds back or at least make mm. the funds um, unusable. Um, and that's something uh, I've been reading this um, just in the background. I've been, uh, it's this chain analysis report mm -hmm. looking at, where money is going from ransomware groups and tying it to specific locations mm -hmm. in Moscow. Um, and the more that you can do that and you can find out, you know, where these funds are going, make sure that they can't be used outside of Russia. You know, I think those kinds of things where you can, you know, isolate, make the funds less usable, you know, yeah. make the whole thing less appealing, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, maybe that's going to, that's one avenue of approach. Other regulatory options that have been discussed um, focus on the targets themselves and uh, things like, well, reporting. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen enormous conversations about when a victim should report or when a victim must report and uh, the mandatory kind of discussion there. And, of course, um, paying a ransom, mm. whether, whether yeah. that is... Uh, a legitimate option or whether it should be uh, specifically uh, un ruled unlawful or, or, or made 
taken off the table uh, in order to you know, prevent uh, a, a corporation or a target uh, paying a ransom in any sense, uh, because that's deemed to you know, sort of encourage further attacks and um, you know f- fuel uh, the criminal behaviour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, it's easier to to think about making a ransom unlawful than it is to think about how that could be done in practice and whether that should be done in terms of taking that option off the table. It's easy to uh, imagine circumstances where a target um, may have very little choice but to potentially pay a ransom if they are genuinely uh, stuck. And uh, we saw in the case of the pipeline attacks, you know, the FBI were open about helping and facilitating that ransom payment. Uh, this is despite their official ongoing advice, as with most countries, that you know, we recommend nobody pay the ransom mm-hmm. uh, because no guarantee to get your data back and so on. Uh, so I'm not sure whether you know it is a legitimate solution or not to make paying ransom unlawful. It's one that uh, is discussed a lot. Mm-hmm. You could <clears throat> imagine circumstances where it may well force a, a target to just uh, pay it anyway. If they had no other option or genuinely believed they had no other option, then, you know, they might be uh, forced to do that. So any mm. thoughts about mm-hmm. about any of that? That's tempting. It's so nice to have, you know, just a simple approach. Um, I mean, the best case scenario is if you pass legislation that banned it, okay, well, you know, if you're, if you're a board member or a CEO, you're not going to authorize a payment, are you? Because you know you don't want if you're looking at prison time or you know whatever the, the, the penalties are going to be, then you're not going to do it. So you know overnight you would eliminate Australia or you know wherever. Mm. I think as a as a place where ransomware attacks, you know, I think it would have an immediate. I think it would have an immediate effect. But are you prepared to put, you know, a CEO in jail if they? violate those laws you know and that's that's a big call Mm. yeah and i think what that makes me think of is is just that you know if if a country managed to to pass that sort of legislation it would even if it put them out of the in in the clear so to speak it would just push the push the activities elsewhere wouldn't it yeah well you also wonder if australia did that and ransomware groups recognized a threat to their income if such a thing spread then maybe there's an incentive to do massive retaliatory strikes against Australia just to paralyze Australian business and prove mm-hmm. that it's not a viable option. option. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's problems. There's problems with it. Yeah, and uh, you can potentially envisage scenarios, like I said earlier, where the the cost benefit may be calculated and depending on the consequences of uh, non-compliance, it may be doing mm. that, a, that a corporation may elect to pay a ransom in, in, this, in spite of the, the yeah. regulatory environment. A corporation know. committing a crime? <laughs> Heaven forbid. <laughs> it, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult scenario. If, you, if you're yeah. faced with it with uh, mm-hmm. potentially tens of billions of dollars in, in losses, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars in, in losses in terms of your data or your systems or your share price or, mm-hmm. or whatever, you might take a punt to to go forward. So it, it is a yeah very complicated scenario and it just can't be solved from, from one or even a number of these approaches on their own. And I think an underlying theme uh, to this whole session has really been teasing apart that complexity Mm -hmm. in multiple ways, Mm -hmm. both in terms of how the states um, might uh, facilitate or enable the groups to operate or certainly thrive uh, from how the groups themselves form and function and uh, evade detection and uh, are flexible and adaptable in response to interventions and that uh, enables them to just shut down and re-emerge in another name, uh, following another brand and, Mm -hmm. you know, making it harder to trace the etymology and evolution of these groups over time. I've got potentially one last question before we wrap up, uh, which would be how we would balance uh, between a proactive nature of offensive cyber operations, uh, as say conducted by, well, in this case, a nation state, uh, and the reactive nature of law enforcement as conducted by 
um, a, a nation state. So we have, again, uh, a question about how we try to deal with the activities of ransomware groups and what the role might be for offensive operations in this space. Mm. Let's start with you, James, if, any thoughts? Yeah, it's a great question. <clears throat> well, I mean, <clears throat> obviously a law enforcement response to a criminal actor is a preferable one. Um, but if it's not possible because you've got um, a host state, you know, providing safe haven, then I think it, it definitely opens up the scope for those other those other things because there needs to be a way to impose costs and if those costs can't be imposed through the criminal justice system then they need to be imposed by other other means and i think that's relatively clear and also <clears throat> i think if you have you know traditionally if you have states that aren't at war with one another well then you don't have state agencies undertaking offensive operations against the citizens of you know or you know organizations in in, in a different state but if, it's, if a state is deliberately and um, willfully abrogating its responsibility to enforce laws um, that, uh, you know, that, that prevent victimization in other countries, I think that, you know, you can, you can forego the, the state niceties and not targeting, you know, other people's, you know, people mm -hmm. in other states, you know, criminals in other states. So, <clears throat> you know, I think, I think that, you know, the gloves can, can come off there to some extent, but <clears throat> you need to think carefully about things like escalation then. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're using state um, resources and organizations to, to attack an, you know, another state uh, or its, its interests or its citizens, then <clears throat> yeah, you need, to, you need to think carefully about that. What, what are the ways that escalation is avoided? You know, how do you limit damage to the people that you know? How do you, how do you actually attribute blame? And we've, you know, attribution is one of the, the big problems here <clears throat> um, because we can say with you know, reasonable degrees of certainty, you know, which IP addresses are involved and, and whatnot, but you know, nailing that down to specific people in a murky online environment. <clears throat> I mean, this is a question for a cybersecurity professional, I guess, but it, it's that's that's tricky, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, they're just some mm. you know, some thoughts. But I you know, I think it, I think it's something that needs to be thought about more because at the moment we've got we've got, I think, certainly ransomware groups, but I think supporting nation states as well, exploiting the a gap between responses here where we're, we're thinking okay only you know law enforcement response or you know we've got what economic sanctions and you know stuff that's really sort of at the extreme end and i think there needs to be mm. you know something more in the middle ground here um because that's proportional you know to what's to what's happening that's a bit like yeah a state going after the activities of criminal organizations, where they are based, where they are located, and uh, how they would go about doing that is an interesting question because short of physically entering another uh, territory mm -hmm. in, the, in the physical world, there are, there are a few ways it could be done. Uh, you can't sort of invade another country with uh, police officers. You know, mm -hmm. It's obviously got to be done by agreement, by consensus. Uh, in the digital world, uh, I guess offensive operations can happen in, in a very different context. You could see uh, the US, for instance, going after uh, all of Rebel's infrastructure, no matter where it was digitally located. And mm -hmm. I think they, they were pretty clear that they were going to go about doing that if, if the Russian um, law enforcement weren't supporting or at least uh, responding to their request for assistance in that regard. So again, doing that when there is an agreement or when they've, uh, I guess, forewarned the potential country that this is what their activities mm -hmm. might involve is one thing, but could you foresee them potentially going after other uh, criminal groups in the absence of any kind of agreement or discussion? Um, I don't know. I think you have some forewarning. I mean, you know, Biden and Putin clearly weren't on good terms um you know before the colonial pipeline attacks or anything there but i think the that they just said okay well this is what's going to happen we're going to impose costs unless you do mm -hmm. and here's why mm -hmm. um so you know i wouldn't call that an agreement but mm -hmm. you're foreshadowing you know what's going to happen and and the reasons why you're doing what you're doing i think that that's 
that seems sensible to me. And then it does provide, it, then it, it puts the other state in the dilemma where they have to sit there and go, okay, uh, what are we going to do? Are they bluffing? Do we need, should we impose these costs ourselves? Does, what makes us look better, look better in this situation? Um, you know, we're going to look like we're US lackeys and caving to pressure, or do we look like we're the ones in control of our country and we're calling the shots mm -hmm. from what happens here? And we would look weaker if, you know, the US managed to, you know, significantly damage, you know, infrastructure or cause, you know, some other problems in our country. That's, that's exactly the kind of, I think, you know, that's exactly the kind of dilemma that leaders like that don't want to be dealing with. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that in itself, imposing a dilemma on another leader is a cost uh, that they're going to sit there and go, okay, is, is, is it worth us supporting, you know, tacitly or otherwise the kind of activities that are attracting this sort of attention? Mm. Yeah. And we talk about operational security, you talked about some of the questions for cybersecurity uh, firms in terms of uh, how they identify where these individuals are based and so on. Uh, I remember reading, I think it was at least one of the members who were arrested recently of Rebel were apparently using the same uh, social media handle on a range of accounts, including <laughs> Facebook. So they uh, clearly didn't practice good operational security <laughs> in that context. <laughs> So I think we're probably ready to wrap it up. Any final last words from anybody? No, I think we've covered a good range of topics. Yep. Okay. So thank you again for your participation and uh, we hope you've got something out of this session and uh, we would like to continue this conversation however we can. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.